Good morning again. It's a blessing to see all of you here this morning, especially new faces. I'm thankful that you arrived here safely and that you will experience a safe trip back to your homes. I'm thankful that I survived another Thanksgiving traveling on Highway 4 to Orlando and back. And I did something this Thursday evening, this past Thursday evening, that I've never done before and I never would do again. I went to a shopping mall. <laughs> that was not a wise decision. How many of you believe that you can correctly spell most of the words that you use when you speak? I want to begin my remarks this morning by asking you to spell a word that we frequently use in the English language. And I'm going to pronounce it, and then I want for you to spell it, but you only get one chance. So I've got one volunteer to spell it. Two. Three. well-meaning 
participations in church activities, including outreach activities, were motivated by fear of punishment or hope of reward, I came to the point where I actually said to God, I can no longer live this way. I do not intend to continue to live the Christian life this way. What I want to share with you this morning is how God rescued me from this condition. God began His rescue of me by making me aware of two important words through one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The first time that I recognized the importance of this word was when I read in the Review and Herald of December 23rd, 1890, the following statement. Quote, when the end comes, when the end of life comes on this earth, when the end comes, one interest will prevail. One subject will swallow up all other subjects. Christ our righteousness. Amen. End quote. Then God made me aware of a second important word. This same writer, two years later, wrote the following statement. This one is uh, found in Volume 7 of the Seventh-day Adventist Commentary Series, page 964. I'll quote it to you. Justification by faith and the righteousness of Christ are the themes to be presented to a perishing world. End quote. Then God did something incredible. He introduced me to two words that I had never read or heard before. The first word was exegesis. E-X-E-G-E-S-I-S. -E -E so I looked it up in a dictionary. Webster's Dictionary and the Collegiate Dictionary. And there it was. And it gave several definitions for the word exegesis. I want to read to you the very last definition in Webster's Dictionary. The critical analysis of a word's meaning, especially of the Bible. I said to myself, here God is teaching me one of the rules to study His Word from a secular dictionary. Then God introduced me to a second word. This one's a little longer. Hermeneutics. H-E-R-M-E-N-E-U-T-I-C-S. And again, I looked it up in the dictionary and I read the different definitions and at the very bottom, a very interesting definition. I want to read it to you. The study of God, in parenthesis, theology, through the principles of exegesis, end quote. I said, this is incredible. God is teaching me how to te study His Word from a secular dictionary. Amen. What does exegesis mean? It means that we need to look up words in a concordance. Look them up in English. It has the word in English, and then it has the word in the original language in which that word was written, and then it gives you the definition of that word. When I realized how God wants me to study His Word, and the importance of these two words, righteousness and justification, the first thing that I did was go and buy this monstrosity of a book. This is called a concordance. The reason that it's so large is because every word in the Old and the New Testament is listed there. I then looked up the words righteousness and justification. And I was amazed to learn that there are nine different usages in the Greek New Testament for the two words in English that we use, righteousness and justification. Nine different definitions. But all these definitions came from one root word in the Greek language. In English, it's justification. In Greek, the root word is spelled D-I-K-A-I-O, dikaio. Then, when you look up the word in your Bible, 
justification or righteousness, then you see that it adds a suffix. And then you understand the meaning of the word. How the Bible writer is using that word. As I learned the nine different meanings of the word justification and righteousness, I realized what a distorted understanding I had of the gospel and how God saved the human race in Christ Jesus. Amen. Once I understood from Scripture what Christ actually accomplished for the human race by His birth, life, death, and resurrection, I then understood why and how Jesus lived His life on this earth when He was here 2,000 years ago. Jesus made it very clear when He was here 2,000 years ago that He of Himself could do nothing. In other words, He came to redeem you and me. And the very first thing that He realizes is that He's not able to on His own power. Read it for yourself. I can't read all the scriptures for you, but in, in uh, John 5, 19 and John 5, 30, it's very clear. It says, I cannot do any of the other things that the Father sent me to do on my own power. And then in John 14, 10, he says something that it took me a while to accept this. He says, when I was down on earth, I did not take my own initiative to do anything. I did not even open up my mouth to utter a word unless it was the Holy Spirit impressing me what to say. I'm going to prove that to you right now from Scripture. In Luke chapter 4, we learn that Jesus has heard the call of the Holy Spirit to go and be baptized by John the Baptist. And in verse 1 of Luke 4, he's baptized. Then what does Jesus do? Nothing. We learn that the Holy Spirit now takes Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights when he does, and he doesn't participate of solid food. Then what happens? The Holy Spirit now brings Jesus back and plops him right in front of Satan. And he tempts Jesus three times. But in verse 6, something amazing happens. In Luke 4, verse 6, I'm going to read it to you. I want for you to listen very carefully to what Satan says to Jesus. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain, control of this earth, and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. What did Jesus say? What's the matter with you, stupid? Have you forgotten that I'm the one that created you in heaven? And you're going to tempt me? Did Jesus say that? In John 14, 30, Jesus says of Satan, he is the ruler of this earth. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4 says, Satan is the God of this world. Jesus never argued with Satan. But we learn in verses 4, 8, and 10, 12, with each of the three temptations, that Jesus says, What? It is written. Is that a clue for us? Amen as to how we should deal with the temptations that God permits Satan to bring into our lives. So this is how Jesus lived his life on this earth, by turning every decision, experience, and temptation over to his Heavenly Father. Yes, he was here physically, but where was his faith focused? On his Heavenly Father. And 100% dependent on the Holy Spirit leading him for three and a half years of his ministry. The Apostle Paul summarizes this in Romans 3, 21 and 22. I will quote it to you. Romans 3, 21. But now, here comes one word, the righteousness of God without the law has been manifested. Being witnessed by, here it comes again, the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that what? Believe. I am now going
going to spend a very brief period of time on not nine, but just three of the words in the New Testament. Righteousness and justification. I'm going to begin and I invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And we're going to begin with verse 12. Romans chapter 5. And you're there, stay ready, and I'll read. Romans chapter 5, beginning with verse 12. Therefore, what does the word therefore mean? It is a summarizing word. The writer has been writing about something, and now he's going to summarize everything that he's been writing about. Therefore, just as through one singular, M-A-N, singular, sin, that's a noun, speaking of the sin problem, entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all, plural, sin. Then in verses 13 to 17, Paul explains what he just got through saying in verse 12. And now, what does he do? He now summarizes everything in verse 18 that he just got through writing in verses 12 through 17. I will read to you, and here's our first word that we're going to focus on this morning. Verse 18. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all, plural, M-E-N, plural, even so, through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. The word justification that Paul uses in the last part of verse 18 of chapter 5 in the Greek language is spelled D-I-K-I-O and now we add the suffix S-I-S and is pronounced dikaiosis. Do you know what that word means in the original language? <coughs> it means acquittal. From a legal standpoint, it means that someone has paid a debt on behalf of someone else, legally releasing that person from that debt. Dikaiosis. That's what the word justification means in Romans 5. 18. In other words, Jesus has corporately justified or taken away the condemnation, the acquittal that our great grandparents Adam and Eve brought upon us when they chose to become self dependent instead of God dependent. I'm going to now use a parable, a real world illustration, so that all of you can understand what the word justification means in Romans 5.18. It's just used two times in all the New Testament. The first time is in the last verse of chapter 4 of Romans. And here's the second time in Romans 5.18. How many of you have a driver's license? Good. How many of you are looking forward to have a driver's license? Good. From time to time, my wife and I invited to participate in other churches. When I was here nine years ago, the Outreach Ministries Director for the Florida Conference arranged for us to go to many, many different churches in the state of Florida. We went as far south as the Temple Church, and we went as far north as Jacksonville. This is a parable. This is a parable. What's a parable? A picture painted with words. So, one Sabbath morning, my wife and I are driving to Jacksonville, and after we get past Daytona Beach, on 95, I realized that I'm going to be late for the speaking appointment. So I decided to speed up. There's very little traffic. And after a while, I realized, boy, we're doing pretty good. We may make it on time. And then I noticed in the rear view mirror a car with flashing lights on the top of the car. And I said, well, I better move over to the side so I can go unobstructed and catch whoever they're after. But as I move over to the middle lane, I notice that the other car with the flashing lights moving, moves into the middle lane and real, comes real close to me. And then a little siren goes on. And I know where it's at. So I pull over. The 
police officer comes and says, let me see your driver's license. So I hand it to him. He then walks to his car, and he starts writing on a little pad. Then he pulls out something, piece of paper, comes back, hands me my driver's license and a receipt. And he says, I clocked you at over 120 miles an hour. But I'm just going to put down 120 miles an hour. Which means that you cannot pay for this traffic violation by mail or writing a check. You have to appear in court. And then he says, by the way, why are, you such, why are you in such a hurry? So I explained to him that I had a speaking appointment in church and I'm ready later. I was trying to make up some time. He says, do you see that sign over there? I said, yes. What does it say? 70 miles an hour. And in the small print, it does not say, and it's okay to break it. That is, if you're running late for a speaking appointment. <laughs> and he's saying this with a straight face. So, move forward, and I appear in court. And the judge asked me the same question. Where were you going sir, to drive so fast? So I explained my story. And he said, well, sir, for common citizen, there is no exception for breaking the speed limit. Let me see your driver's license. So I handed it to him. He says, I'm indefinitely, indefinitely revoking your driver's license. But that's not all. I am now going to fine you $1,000, $200, for 10 miles an hour, then you broke the speed limit. And I said, Your Honor, I do not have that kind of money in my checking account. He says, No problem. We have a very flexible program in Florida to pay off your debt. <laughs> he says to the bailiff, Bailiff, come and take this man to jail and let him work off his fine at $200 a day. As the bailiff is taking me away, someone in the courtroom says, Your Honor, may I pay for this person's traffic violation? And the judge says, yeah, as long as you have enough funds. He says, no problem. The person writes a check. The judge says to the bailiff, let this man go. His debt has been paid in full. I now, I now walk out of the courtroom and the courthouse. And I notice that someone is following me very closely. And I turn around, and it's the person that wrote the check. And I say to the person, I don't know who you are. I don't know why you paid my traffic violation, but I want to thank you for keeping me out of jail. He says to me, my name is Jesus Christ. And when I was here on this earth officially 2,000 years ago, I too had to qualify for a driver's license. Is that biblical? Turn to Matthew chapter 3. And the way that I qualified for a driver's license was by going to John the Baptist and being baptized. Matthew chapter 3. When you get there, say ready, and I'm going to read three verses for you. Matthew chapter 3. Ready? Matthew chapter 3, beginning with verse 13. 13. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John, verse 14, tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized of you, and you're asking me to baptize you. Look at Jesus' answer in verse 15. Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all what? Here's the second word we're going to take a look at. The word righteousness here is speaking of what Jesus did to restore my driver's license. But I want to touch on something very important. The Bible tells us that the baptism of John was known as the baptism of what? Repentance. Mark 1 verse 4 and Acts 19 4 makes that very clear. Why would Jesus need to repent of anything since he never sinned in thought, word, or act? The answer is in Galatians chapter 4, 4 and 5, where we learn, and I'll quote it to you, when the fullness of the time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, 
born under the law in order so that he could what? Redeem those that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons and daughters. Do you know who that included? Child molesters, rapists, murderers, liars, and in my illustration, irresponsible drivers. And that's what the word righteousness means in Matthew 3, 15. It's spelled, here we go, D-I-K-A-I-O, and now we have the suffix S-U-N-E, D-I-K-A-I-O-S-U-N-E, and that means a title of righteousness. According to my parable, a driver's license. A driver's license and a title of righteousness that Jesus wants to impute to me. Now, how difficult was it for Jesus to obtain this driver's license? Let's find out how Jesus prayed when he was on this earth. I'm not talking about Matthew 6. Verses uh, 9 through 13, where Jesus teaches his disciples the Lord's Prayer. What I'm talking about is the way that Jesus himself felt it necessary for him to pray to his heavenly Father. So I invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to learn how Jesus and why Jesus prayed the way that he did to his heavenly Father. When, you, when we get to Hebrews chapter 5, say ready. And I'm going to read two verses for you. Beginning, I hear some leaves, pages still turning. Here we go. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning with verse 7. In the days of his flesh. Is days singular or plural? Why is that important? Because many are being taught today that Jesus only took on our sins at the cross. But here, according to Scripture, it says that when He came into this world, He was born of a woman. A sinful woman. So He took upon His sinless divine nature, my sinful nature, in order to ethically and legally be able to redeem me. In the days of his flesh, the word flesh in the Greek is S-A-R-X. It's speaking of my nature. When the Bible writers speak of our body, the physical part of all of us that we can see, it uses the word S-O-M-A, soma. But here it's speaking of my sinful nature. In the days of his sinful nature, flesh, he, Jesus, offered up both prayers and supplications. How? with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. That's the second death. And he was heard because of his piety, because of his reverence. Now look at verse 8. Although he was the Son of God, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Unfortunately, Satan, being the master of all deception, has had most Christians focus on the physical aspect of the cross. The bleeding. Why did the Romans crucify people? Because it was the most shameful way to kill a human being. And the way that would take the longest time to kill a human being. But Jesus died in a matter of hours after he was crucified. So that approach of crucifying someone completely failed. Why? One writer says, because Jesus died from a broken heart. Amen. The author of the book Desire of Ages makes a very interesting comment on verses 7 and 8 of Hebrews chapter 5. I'd like to read it to you. But Christ, coming to earth as a man, lived a holy life and developed a perfect character. The creator of the universe, in order to ethically and legally save me, 
needed to come to this world in my equipment and develop a perfect what? You're going to be interested in the second sentence. This he offers as a free gift to all who will receive it. End quote. Amen. Desire of Ages, page 762.